the passage of time, the the attainments, the hopes, the dreams, with the ongoing pathway where we're struggling upwards. I think that there's plenty to work with for people who have hopes for the future. So that painting was the first one to show the real Mars as, as it actually was with uh, all the legend and uh, folk tales and illusions stripped away. It's a part of our destiny that we can create. It's not there ready for us. We're going to have to work for it. Welcome to the Build the Future podcast. Today, we're talking with a brilliant artist and illustrator, Don Davis. Don is an absolute legend, having created some of the most prominent paintings of the moon, of our solar system, and of space habitats. Don is without a doubt one of the one of the, the giants whose shoulders we stand on when we think about what it would look like for humans to explore space. So, lovely conversation with Don. Let's jump right in. Don, good to see you. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Excited to talk with you today about space and art and all related related things. Thank you. Good to be here. So you and I had a we had a call you know, a couple of weeks ago after I sort of dove down the rabbit hole on space habitats um, and was deeply moved and inspired by one of the images that you did for uh, Gerard O'Neill with this, uh, or a couple of them either for the space settlements uh, and then I found your blog. And kind of dove down the rabbit hole there. And one of the pieces that really stood out to me was your anniversary sort of log on uh, Apollo 11. And, you know, I want, can you tell me, can you tell me about the, like that sort of series of posts? Because it was, you know, 20 plus years. And then when I read it, I was like, wow, this feels very nostalgic and also very sort of like powerful because you document both the current moment and, you know, 50 years prior. So you tell, tell us a little bit about, about that sort of like why you were doing that, what the moon means to you and the sort of things that people forget about and like why the moon is important. An amazing bit of uh, reference and perspective that we can apply with our lifetimes and then extending that to the history, the historical record going even a lot, a lot further a lot of that it, it is it's really profound to ponder. And uh, when we look back at, the, say, you know, 50 years after Apollo 11, and then we would imagine what took place in the 50 years prior to Apollo 11, where we were then, what stories were making the news, what passions and concerns were making the rounds then. Every time I did... Uh, that look back, looking through several um, huge, thick historical volumes I have and such, I was struck by parallels or references to uh, science and astronomy and, and the opening up of, of frontiers that were taking place then, as well as uh, news headlines, some of them rather grim, and some of them which resonated uh, with themes ongoing in the present. So the perspective as well as the commonality and the differences intrigued me. So for some 20 years, I wrote of, the, of these in the context of where we were at that time. So each year we see a progression. I stopped doing that when uh, 50 years before Apollo uh, 11 was 1917, because that was the birth year of John F. Kennedy, uh, mm. the president who set the ball rolling on Apollo, and I thought that was as good a place as any uh, to um, to call it quits. But I would go back to the 50th anniversary, I think, if you were to pick any one of those to read, where I, I put my all into it. It's just because yeah. uh, I thought I would stop doing it then. The passage of time, the the attainments, the hopes, the dreams, the, uh, the tragedies, the, the terrible things, but the ongoing pathway where we're struggling upwards, we're, yeah. we're in a constant race between attainment and achievement and decay and catastrophe. And those themes intrigue me and in how we are trying to uh, climb the ladder, which is uh, burning around us sometimes and, and what we can do to make a better future and a better life. I think the perspective of what we have done and what can happen as our imagination gives us, I think that there's plenty to work with for people who have hopes for the future. Totally. Yeah, I love your your quote. Uh, I, I wrote it down. It's 
yeah, the day seems to be on the horizon when a new generation will know what we have known, that the earth is not the limit for humanity. I just thought that was like a really sort of beautiful encapsulation of like all of that history. It's just like, this is not, this is not the end. What oh, it's just, uh, it's like in the big, after the, the last words in the first Star Trek film, the, the human adventure is just beginning. Like, what was it like? I mean, you were telling me that, uh, you know, you're a child of the space race. Like, what was it like growing up? Tell me about when you were watching the the Apollo mission. Like, what was what was that like? What was the world like at the time for you as a kid? Oh, it was such a grand adventure. I was just old enough to appreciate what it was about. Invariably, I have to refer to uh, my first memory of a news event, which uh, was the launch of Sputnik One. Yeah, and uh, in, in October '57, our kindergarten teacher made sure that we. We had that event impressed on our little minds as she marked it on the calendar on that day. And that sort of set the uh, mold for for my being a child of the space age. And uh, so as as uh, things continued, the way I would see on TV, you know, the Mercury flights, uh, the progression to the from the one man a uh, space capsule to the two-man ship that Gemini, as they were working toward t- attaining the capabilities they would need for rendezvous and, and such in order to uh, make sure a Project Apollo had clear sailing. And so the progression to the three-man spacecraft, Apollo took place you know, in the later 60s. And that was, uh, you know, again, we had so much to look forward to magazines and books were full of, of concepts of what it would be like on the moon of anticipating this great adventure and uh, so i remember the uh, first saturn V rocket when that launched uh, that was shown live on tv and just seeing that thing this this 360 plus foot tall leviathan launching on its pillar of flame and you could hear in the background everybody cheering and the uh, uh, press control room wherever that voice could reach the microphones that sense of, of human passion of trying almost to levitate it by the sheer force of will all the 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 will the work that came into seeing that moment take place and if it was a first saturn five launch that was a very pivotal moment and of course after that we would uh, uh start reaching for the moon because once we had the vehicles to get there the pivotal uh, moment for me in my interest in the moon was working for the U.S. Geological Survey branch of astrogeologic studies. Yeah. I pronounce that very carefully because a lot of people have said as, 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 astrology studies or such. Astrology <laughs> studies. <laughs> Truncate the syllables and such. But um, so... What happened was I was in high school in uh, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, the USGS branch uh, uh, in Menlo Park, they were looking for students they needed for a relatively menial but but skill set uh, requiring task of coloring maps. You see, back in the days before they had uh, color printers, they would have these big machines, sort of like blueprint machines, where it smelled of ammonia, and these big sheets would come out, massive sheets that wide, and um, they would have uh, the lines, the all the boundaries of, of the different provinces, geologic units, as they were called. And so we would take those and we had on the wall a big array of colored pencils and each of the pencils had a specific label which matched the uh, designation of each of the areas that we had to color. So we would hand color these maps uh, with the, with these Prismacolor colored pencils. And that was to be my original task. But when I went um, for my job interview, I brought a painting of the moon that I had done. And the person who interviewed me uh, was Don Wilhelms, who is among the great lunar gurus still alive and of all time. And he looked at that painting and I said, and said you're hired. Yeah. You know? <laughs> because he had a project in mind that was, uh, he wanted to show the, the face of the moon, the details of the moon as it appeared in earlier geologic eras. And uh, that required uh, skill sets that he didn't have access to there in Menlo Park. And when I showed up, 
without painting, all of a sudden the piece fell into place in his head. And uh, that was the uh, project that I began uh, very early. It was uh, like the, uh, as I recall, November 68, uh, when I was hired, that was right around the time when I first started working was when the Beatles quite album was released. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I got to, uh, see, uh, a, a kind of a front row seat as to what we were learning about the moon and about the planets, uh, where all the data was coming in, the photographs yeah. and such. And so that was the cream of the crop, the actual real meat of the data uh, that, uh, as the Apollo missions came in, we would have books that would have all the photographs taken aboard the missions, these color prints. And I spent endless hours looking through those. And of course, they had all the uh, lunar orbiter photos of the moon, and these various um, giant mosaics that were like 20 feet tall. You could pull them out on these big wooden boards that were that were in a kind of a vertical file. And that was just an amazing thing to to see all the little boulders and such that you could see. The moon was really becoming uh, well-known at around that time. And uh, so all of a sudden getting an inside look at what we were learning, uh, that, that made a huge difference. And from then on, the moon has been a celestial body that is most intimately connected with my career. Well, it must have been really, really fascinating because up until that point, like until you actually had real data coming from the space law, space missions, it was all speculative. So everyone was like kind of coming up with stuff to imagine what the moon would look like based on maybe telesco telescopic sort of views. But actually having the data, the, the mapping and the satellites to try and figure out what it actually looks like was, was really kind of created a whole new era of like realistic space art, right? Because then you were Absolutely. able to take that and do stuff with it. Absolutely. As we learned, was that the first looks we got at the first uh, of the surface of the moon were from uh, Soviet and then uh, American robot probes yeah. landed on the surface. And we f first we learned, well, OK, the moon's hard enough to support a spacecraft. Yep. There was a little bit of speculation that the moon might be covered with a, a, a layer of fine dust that things would be swallowed up in. But that ended up being uh, proven wrong. And um before uh, we actually got to see the surface, of course, we had to only guesswork. And different artists uh, guessed in, in different ways and with different degrees of success. Some, like uh, Lucien Rudeau, a French artist, he would look at the moon and see the mountains as being relatively uh, rounded and uh, gentle slope. On the edge of the moon, he, he made observations, and so some of his paintings reflected that. And Chesley Bonestell, he tended to use telescope photos, and uh, his eye were fooled by the extreme contrast of these pictures, and it looked the moon looked much more craggy than it actually ended up. So he ended up doing a number of paintings, beautiful paintings, uh, but there was a fairly consistent vertical exaggeration in a lot of these works. It's kind of similar in, in, a, in retrospect to the vertical exaggeration that some computer graphics uh, use when they're showing planetary surfaces. So it's it's not a wasted effort, but it was uh, the, the surface though, the actual detail when you're when you're standing there, that was just completely, complete guesswork. And yeah. different artists uh, tried different approaches, but uh, Chesley Bonestell did uh, a number of paintings one of which came relatively close, showing a rocky, rubble-strewn surface, like like as if a bunch of pounded rocks were laid on the surface and 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 such. So, Don, I want to I want to you tell 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 us about the story of how you get Carl Sagan to to become a fan of the moon. The <laughs> emphasis of Carl's a lot of his work was, of course, Mars and yeah. uh, and such, and very interesting place, very mysterious place. And uh, the moon it didn't seem to have uh, you know, much likelihood of life on it. And uh, its history was uh, such that uh, it's very ancient, very uh, uh, slow progress of changes there. And he tended to consider the moon boring. Yeah. Um, however, um, the project that uh, I worked on with Don Wilhelms to recreate the appearance of the moon in earlier geologic eras, that 
it was to be published, and it was published in Icarus magazine, a planetary uh, journal. And the editor at that time was Carl Sagan. Mm. So he saw that, and um, they were reproduced very nicely in the magazine. And in fact, it was about a, a little, a, a, about a year later that I uh, I met Carl. And one of the scientists, a computer scientists who worked over at the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab, Paul Fox, he invited me into this uh, gathering, which took place at this kind of a communal household uh, on land at that time owned by Joan Baez. Mm. And so quite a crowd of people were there. It was just interesting. And uh, I was circulating around and Paul said, hey, come here. Let's, let's want to introduce you to Carl. And I had brought a painting of, uh, uh, of Mars to that meeting and had it propped up against the wall. So he led me to where Carl was. And there Carl was looking at that painting close up with his glasses off, inspecting every minute detail. And... Uh, I, I knew that he would appreciate it because that painting was done uh, with the aid of the uh, Mariner 9 Mars Orbiter data, which was the first information we had of what the topography, the relief across the planet Mars was actually like. So that painting was the first one to show the real Mars as, as it actually was with uh, all the legend and... Uh, folk tales and illusions stripped away so that when he saw that 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 made our introduction a lot easier yeah and that uh, i mentioned about uh, that i had done the uh the uh reconstructions of the ancient moon that he published in icarus and, oh you did those and i want you to know i worked really hard to make sure they were reproduced as well as possible in the magazine there so he really appreciated that and then later on uh when Cosmos was made, I was one of the uh, the artists uh, who worked on that, model builders and such, uh, paintings that I had done later for Don Wilhelms of the history of the moon, showing it changing in, in, in smaller steps in the previous uh, paintings, uh, and they were in color. Those ended up being used on Cosmos. Carl made sure that they were used. And uh, they were um, horizontal. Uh, they were of a format that was awkward to reproduce on TV. But Carl said, no, do it anyway. Put them sideways. I don't care. And and so uh, I, I like to think that I helped him pay a little bit more attention to the moon in the scheme of things. I love to get a little, a little philosophical. What is like, the, the importance of being able to, to visualize you know, some of these concepts, because I mean, we have the, the moon and, get, you know, showing it on Cosmos and in uh, Icarus. Um, like, why, why does that matter to people? Being able to visualize something, to show something rather than explain it in pages of text or in addition to is a very valuable way to, 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 to gather information. The visual uh, pathway to the brain are just uh, just streamlines the uh, the concepts in so many ways so often and uh, so like being able to show you know, the history uh, it, in in uh, geologic terms of this or that feature it's relatively common in geology there are series of Im illustrations that were shown of um, crater lake when it was forming with this this giant eruption of this volcano that had the top blown off and paintings were done of that over time and just being able to uh, hiring a good artist who who was very informed and had good advice on the details uh it's a very valuable way of uh, conveying such information because it, like it also helps us you know fill in the gaps in in like our imagination right because i think about it's it's funny there's an interesting parallel that just just now occurred to me which is you know you have certain science fiction which i know well, I won't, I won't ask you about your favorite science fiction, but you have like Jules Verne writing this hard sci-fi that was kind of informed by reality. In a, in a similar way, kind of your art and, you know, art of sort of the space era was informed by reality, but there were gaps that had to be filled in. So it's like yeah, the very gaps, real stuff, but... There's always gaps and that that's where... It, the more you learn about the subject matter, the, the the likely, the more likely you are that those gaps will be filled in plausibly. Yeah. Invariably, there's guesswork involved. When you do a painting 
many paintings done of, of space throughout the decades, if they're done with due research uh, and knowledge of, of, of what is known at the time, they preserve almost like a fossil of what was known at that time of these places. So that's why when you look at paintings from the 40s and 50s showing Mars with these lines across it, the, the so-called canals, that represented the consensus then. And um, then later, as soon as we get real information, we start seeing uh, like the Earth, the real clouds with their intricate whorls and spirals and such. Whereas very early paintings of the Earth from space tended to make the clouds a simplified latitudinal pattern. Uh, those are assumptions that were just uh, arbitrary in some cases. So um, little details get filled in. The background behind a lot of, of these details gets known, and that informs uh, one's choices. So, yeah, there's, a, in, in a way, dinosaur art is a similar thing. Uh, advances in what is known about the dinosaurs can be seen in paintings done in the 40s as opposed to paintings done in, in recent decades where a more lively, active uh, ideas of what they were like and the presence of feathers on at least a, some of the smaller ones, various uh, bits of, of knowledge as we gather and have the ability to gather more knowledge. It's the same thing with, uh, with space and with uh, astronomical uh, subject matter. Or I think that uh, the more we learn the more frontiers of, of, of imagination that we artists uh, have to work with. And uh, although there's a tendency now to use such uh, Hubble images and such, which are public domain, instead of uh, artist works, uh, there's still the inspiration is there. And, uh, and, and those of us in, in the space art business never had a greater variety of material to work with than we do now oh yeah it's oh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought up the dinosaurs because that's what i was i, I was gonna bring i was gonna reference is you had charles knight and sort of like visualizing stuff early on from these fossil records and i it's hard for me not to imagine that that work then influenced folks like michael Crichton writing jurassic park and just sort of like Really, and then like you know, all these sort of stories and films around around dinosaurs. Like, because I love dinosaurs as a kid. I watched like The Land Before Time, and like that's probably not what all the dinosaurs looked like. But you know, there's some visualization informed by reality and some imagination kind of mixed in that gave a sense of like, oh, this is this is a plausible possibility. And the better the dinosaur reconstructions done today are 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 probably closer to the mark. Yeah. Especially since, in the case of the Jurassic Park films, they did a whole R and D uh, effort in the background of that, where there were digital models of dinosaurs with muscles and skeletons, work that was never uh, done really in the in the paleontological realm, as far as I know, to, to that extent. So, uh, when somebody wanted to try to research uh, what they should be like, and was willing to fund a little R and D for a film. You know, wonders can be worked, and uh, but yeah, you look further back and the dinosaur um, paintings. They have different uh, uh, different styles. The, the way the tails are dragged on the ground in the uh, early paintings, as opposed to them mostly being held horizontal as a balancing thing. More recently, um, it's very fascinating stuff, and uh, you know the, the, the frontiers of what our Earth was like in the past, the life that has come and gone. There's a movie I'd like to mention briefly. Yeah. So we were, there was a, a film made in the uh, 60s, if I recall correctly, early 60s, uh, by Carl Zeman. I think he was a Czech, Czechoslovakian, I'm not, I, but it was called Journey to the Beginning of Time. And it involved, mm -hmm. um, it was a serialized, that was another source of imagination for me, by the way, were serialized films that were shown on a local kid's uh, space-oriented TV show. In my case, it was a Captain Satellite show. I would show up, uh, I would hurry from school every afternoon to, uh, to watch that. And so they would show uh, a number of things. One of them was the, the Space Explorers, which was a Russian film that had been re-edited uh, with an English uh, language track. But Journey to, to the Beginning of Time involved some uh, boys that were 
uh, setting off on a raft on this river. And as they kept going along this raft, they would encounter uh, animals of an earlier era, like they were going further back in time. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing about this film is that it shows ancient mammals, which had their own great variety and and, and uh, size and such, which you don't normally see portrayed in these in in films of the past. And then they went further back, and you see a battle between a, a couple of dinosaurs, a Stegosaurus and Allosaurus. And, and such, but there's just something about um, about that film which it was it was just ingenious technique. Some of them use stop motion models. Some of them use big puppets and such. So um, the the history of portraying prehistoric animals in film is is, is varied and plentiful. It's super cool to to see. And then you know, I just remember like it, it also seems like we haven't like people have kind of stopped talking about dinosaurs, which is. A different different topic, but it's very fascinating to me. Like I don't I don't you hear all the we hear all the space talk, but we don't hear the the paleontologist talking about you know dinosaurs or new species or new discoveries. Um, and maybe that's because we found them all, which I find somewhat hard to believe. Oh, we we found a good number of them, but uh, of course we we haven't found every species. What remains to be found though is probably variations of. Uh, what has already been found. I doubt if we're going to find anything radically different. But yeah, dinosaurs are like the alien life forms that we had here on this world in the distant past. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's endlessly fascinating subject. I had the numerous plastic models. You can see a few uh, dinosaur skeleton models, yep, little yep. bits of them. Those came out about uh, 19, late 50s. And uh, I have somehow managed to preserve them. Nice. Back to the kind of the role of of the artist and helping us sort of bridge the gaps between what we know and what what could be possible. One of your famous works is around the uh, some of the space settlement projects and kind of getting people, helping people imagine what what life could be like out in space in in L five, uh, as as they said. What was what was that bumper sticker? I think you were telling me about this. It was a L five by ninety five. Yeah, I remember it might have been a T-shirt, actually. Yes, the L5 Society was um, organized and they had some enthusiasts there who uh, were involved in that movement. And there was the L5 News, a nice newsletter that came out. I believe those are all online. And uh, if I recall, it was 76, maybe, uh, 75 or 76, they published a nice uh, color uh, color spread in the middle, which had two of my space colony paintings in it at that time. The uh, mid seventies was, in some ways, the heyday of, of the space colony uh, uh, effort. And in, in retrospect, it had um, just about as much publicity attached to it as as space flight in general had, with a series of articles in Collier's magazine in the fifties with uh, Chesley Bonestell uh, illustrating all of the, these grand schemes of, of fleets of rocket ships and the places they would be visiting, the views of the Earth from orbit and such. So th that was a big campaign that also had a series of books, uh, The Conquest of Space, The Exploration of Mars, written but with uh, great science authors like uh, Willie Lay, and of course, Werner von Braun with his expertise in the exploration of Mars and such. He had been thinking about Mars expeditions for a long time. He even thought about Mars expeditions while he was working on the V2, and he got in trouble because there was a little pamphlet that, that he uh, circulated showing visions of uh, space, uh, of space travel and such with future rockets. And the SS decided to... Uh, uh, give him a hard time for because he 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 was refusing to toe the line with uh, with the with the head of the SS Himmler who wanted to kind of uh, grab him and take over the organization. He was a big one for uh, trying to spread his influence. So they locked up von Braun in a yeah. SS cell for a while. He cooled his heels there until Albert Speer uh, appealed directly to Hitler, said, "We got to get him out of there, or there won't be any V 2 I, yeah. He was as much a puppet and victim of, of 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 the system there as any, and unfortunately, there's been a lot of unkind dog rule um, circulated about him. But uh, 
Mm. Like in my essay on the first flight of the V2, I think I set the record straight as far as I I can tell about that. Yeah. I mean, he was in a, a horrific system there, but he had a visionary aspect to his um, his drive that that transcended and outlasted all of that. And he and his rocket team ended up taking advantage of two unique targets of opportunity to advance the art of rocketry, which ultimately brought us to the moon. Yeah, I remember. Along with all the other, you know, American workers, but the core Pina Mundi team was was a was an essential part, although far from it being everything. Yeah, I remember uh, one of the, the pieces I find most influential was uh, Disney, the program he did with Disney uh, called Man in Space, and then you know the story as the story goes, you know, they show it off, and Eisenhower calls Walt Disney. I need to show this to my generals, and then you know Disney sends him the raw prints. And he shows it around the White House. And then two years later, NASA was founded. And then the, the groundwork was laid for, for the space race. It's that, that sounds plausible, yes. Yeah. But, but in the you know, post, post-Apollo, or, you know, post-landing on the moon, the Gerard O'Neill trying to rally everyone around, hey, like, let's keep this, keep this vision going. Let's, let's go settle, settle space habitats. Um, your work is perhaps the most influential in actually helping shape people's concrete visions of what that what that might look like. And the image I want to, I want to talk to you about and have you kind of tell us about is the image that you did in a, in a space habitat that's similar looking to San Fran, the San Francisco Bay area. Um, and if I recall on your, your blog, you mentioned, um, you know, you deliberately wanted to imply the the challenge of trying to transplant a workable ecosystem to a giant terrarium in space. Most other depictions are dreary mega shopping malls like structures filling the available volume. Talk, talk to us about about this piece and sort of like why it was important to you know show it as like you know I'll, I'll impose on the screen green and lush with water and bridges. Like why did why did this matter and like what was sort of the thinking behind this? The idea of creating an artificial world. A miniature world with a closed ecosystem implies a great deal of understanding and knowledge that needs to be gathered about how ecosystems work and how to maintain a a closed system in a a smaller area. And that amount of uh, of knowledge that that is still largely yet to be gathered uh, is uh, probably the, the... the biggest challenge, even as much as the uh, engineering aspects of this, and the idea of uh, transplanting some of, of the Earth, some of the, the light living cycles and such into a smaller environment, it was always integral to, to the images that I had in my mind and what I extrapolated from uh, O'Neill and others' writings there. So um, it, the idea of, of also, kind of as a personal note, enshrining or portraying the San Francisco Bay Area with the coastal green hills covered with trees, sometimes they have fog rolling over them, and the hills that overlooked the uh, Palo Alto Menlo Park, Atherton, uh, Stanford University area of the Bay Area. That's my my basically what I've always considered my homeland. And that is the place that I wanted to uh, portray and enshrine, if you will, as a personal note in my portrayals. So uh, that painting, when I remember I, I asked O'Neill you know, his opinion of, of what, what a view inside of one of those giant space colonies should be like. And, and he talked about... Uh, with a view from uh, hills looking down on Sausalito and from that end of of the, and looking down at the cities and bridges and boats in the uh, water below and such. And uh, that that was kind of the kernel of the uh, visual um, inspiration, which I drew upon when when doing that painting and that painting of the, uh, the bridge and the trees and such, and the, Gurgling Creek, that is probably the most influential work I ever did. Unfortunately, that work seems to be lost. Nobody knows what happened to it. Yeah, because so, the original print disappeared, right? The original painting the original is gone. Painting. Nobody knows. I, I've got, you know, prints and, uh, of it and such, but um, 
I'm actually working on another version of that. I've decided to replace it, but I'm doing a new a version that has exactly the same view, but as if you switched on a wider angle lens. So the field of view is about almost twice what in the original. So it'll be a oh, supplement fantastic. rather than a copy. But that I, I got to... I got to kick myself and finish that one of these days. Yeah. I mean, I think oil I, painting. Fantastic. I, I think people, people would love to see it because it's just like, this is the most, because when a lot of people think of space settlements, they think, they think of like living on the ISS and the vision that's exciting and compelling is like, we can have beautiful, lush, green human spaces with creeks and ponds and rocks and rivers and bridges and birds. And it just like, it, it like to me, you know, I was like, oh, space habitats, interesting. But it was like this image and a few others that just like expanded my sense of like what could be possible. And which just like gives me chills. Like, this is what we should be aspiring towards. And this is the like, this is the power of like art and like your vision, <laughs> like taking this sort of these ideas and putting them out into the universe. Cause like this may be what we end up building one day. It could well, very well happen. It's one of the options open to us in the future, as long as we have that capability. And uh, yeah, I think uh, you know it'll, it'll take time. We're we're, we're going to build habitats. They're going to be small modules, and then they'll steadily get bigger and bigger and uh, roomier and such. It'll take time, but I think uh, that will be a, a momentum that. Uh, if we have significant human presence in space that when we gather a momentum toward that, I think it'll be inevitable. You, can, you, can you explain? I know you sent me uh, the the currently unpublished thoughts on the the revised thoughts on the high frontier. But in so if you sort of if we sort of contextualize that with the current sort of revitalization of the space industry with SpaceX and Blue Origin and you now the cost per per kilogram coming down, like a lot of the stuff seems to be more like within the realm of possibility it's looking more and more possible all the time there is a, a a steady incremental increase in our space capability and uh yeah if if um if starship can get going it, it's a big if but we'll see how it goes i have some faith in certainly in, in the determination of those involved and uh it seems like a, a terribly clever, but although risky, but we'll see how it goes. So far, every Starship launch they've tried has done a little better than the previous one. So that that's a good initial trend. There's going to be some spectacular blowups ahead, but uh, all rockets, well, almost all. The Saturns actually never had one blow up on the pad, but... Um, those those uh, the Piamundi people with the and the others involved with their super engineering um, they they made sure that, that that didn't happen or the probability was extremely low. But yeah, the momentum does seem to be uh, moving in that direction. The other direction where rocketry is evolving is NASA's uh, space launch system, which is a very impressive thing. But uh, unfortunately, the launches are too few and far between to really provide a sense of uh, the kind of momentum that Apollo did, where we had you had like two launches a year in, in many cases. We Hopefully there'll be a, a, you know, a good use for a rocket with that capability. Uh, but I'm afraid the, uh, the future may well be with uh, you know, these reusable rocket uh, designs that bypass the traditional methods and uh, yeah. the, the shuttle legacy technology and such things. But we got options. We have, you know, other countries are, are looking at reusable launch vehicles. And yeah. one of these days, if we can get the cost per pound down to, uh, or per $100 a kilogram, shall I say, yeah. to switch the metric, that'll probably be a benchmark, which We'll start seeing much more activity and uh, passengers and such going up. And uh, there seems to be a fairly steady curve of uh, heading in the direction that will make these things possible. What do you, what do you think, if, if anything, can we like learn from the past, from, you know, the previous space race, or the, the space era, you know, the 70s sort of space habitats, vision and energy and movements that we might be able to like, draw on today to sort of keep this sort of faith and this sort of energy like active around human exploration of space 
there's always going to be a fan base of uh, yeah. people interested in that and how much, how vocal and how prominent they are able to make themselves is probably the, the determining factor. Uh, a lot of people were interested in the space habitat idea. And, and, and there were some people that were understandably skeptical about it. Uh, when Coevolution Quarterly, you know, the whole Earth people, they yeah. published a, uh, a magazine devoted to uh, a solicited commentary on space colonization. And a lot of them were against it. And, uh, and some of them were wildly for it. But, you know, it, it was interesting to see these different points of view and uh, sometimes they articul articulated objections that made sense, but um, it was interesting just to see the idea of making the rounds and and kind of being given consideration in, in a lot of places by a lot of people. If and when that such a, a, a push might happen again, who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, you know, space matters are proceeding as they are, and as uh, human access to space gets easier, less expensive, I think a lot of these things will just sort of germinate of their own yeah. accord uh, as as our options become clear. Every good movement needs some energy and like pumped into it. So hopefully, you know, part of my sort of deep dive into this is, you know, you and I talking and having conversations with uh, the folks at SSI and such. It's just like, can we, can we like revitalize? Can we sort of help catalyze some of that, that conversation? Maybe, we'll see. We will see. We'll see. There's, you know, people have tried. I, I've, I've got an idea for a planetarium show on the subject, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have the funding. Uh, but, uh, you know, if somebody were to do a, a show where people can be immersed in this vast uh, idea of what such a habitat can be like, uh, either a planetarium where you're sitting under a projected dome or, or some kind of future VR type of headset thing, when those get good enough to be worth seeing. Uh, the, the potential, already you know, the idea has been seen in movies and games and such. So it's being kept alive in incidental scenes in films like Interstellar yeah. uh, and such. Or even, it's it's funny, I just recently watched 2001 A Space Odyssey. Shame on me, you know, I've been, <laughs> I've been fascinated with the area, with the, with the space for a while, but just now, like, started to watch it and just like, like, oh, it'd be super cool to just take people into an environment where they feel like they're on that space habitat. You know, obviously we, we wouldn't want to say, you know, uh, all the, all the outdated companies, you know, that are still, that were sort of like branded on there. I think the Hilton is the only one that's still, still on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, seeing 2001, a space odyssey in 70 millimeter, which I did like, 20 times in the Cinerama Theater in San Jose. Uh, and in those days, like the, the 70 millimeter prints were colored and timed and such according to Stanley Kubrick's personal uh, supervision. So we were seeing his, you know, his vision there on the screen. And the thing about 2001, that it opened up new frontiers for me visually. It helped to validate the interest I had in space travel and such at the time, and the magnificence of the vision and the use of music. That film opened up frontiers of music. Before 2001, it was like uh, classical music was like was like static to, to, to my ears. It just uh, it wasn't something that I had uh, taken much trouble to listen to. But hearing what uh, you know the late romantic. Uh, music that that's that was used in the film and those scenes that just enthralled me and the use of um the uh avant-garde music of Leggetti and such uh it opened up frontiers audio frontiers as much as visual frontiers very influential film to me is, is there anything else like that that like whether it was a book or a film that kind of shaped your yeah it kind of influenced your sense of like what could be possible of course, uh, the conquest of space, uh, yeah. Willie Lay and, and, and Bonestell and such. Those books were were very influential. There was an interesting book that Willie Lay wrote called "Engineers' Dreams." Willie Lay mm -hmm. uh, was a um, great uh, space and science writer, and he had a, a column in Galaxy Science Fiction, which he had a lot of uh, interesting little vignettes about history. He was a very uh, careful like historian and, and uh, lucid science writer. So his book, Engineer's Dreams, shows a series of, of 
ideas of, of what could be done on Earth, mega engineering projects, and some of them not so mega like the Channel Tunnel. He writes about that, and it seemed like forever it would never happen, but finally the Channel Tunnel exists. And uh, so the idea of things like space colonies and such things, that they may sit on the uh, shelf of history gathering dust for a while, waiting for their time to come. But that was an interesting book as far as showing you know, possibilities. And it mentions also early ideas. That's a 50s book, uh, but on, on solar and wind power and um, potential of other novel methods of, of uh, gaining energy and uh, other ideas that uh, might not be practical in today's world. But anyway, the idea of what the human mind can conceive of, of what we can do and what we can plan on for, for our collective destiny. Those are the threads that I found inspiring in, in various books that I had, had read. And uh, there's a, only a little science fiction could I really call inspiring. I've read a, a reasonable share of science fiction, but uh, in general, I found that, I, uh, and I took the adv advice of Chesley Bonestell, who he, he read very little fiction. He found history, what really happened to be far mm -hmm. more interesting and worth one's while to absorb. But that said, you know, there's like the Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. I have to say that was a, a, a early inspiration to me. And just the, the power of, of Bradbury's writing, his, uh, his ability to uh, bring us uh, back to nostalgic eras of what the U.S. was like before the First World War, as well as to project us into the future and questions of communicating with uh, uh, other intelligences and ethical issues and such. Um, it was um, the fascinating thing to to absorb. The Toynbee, one of Bradbury's short stories, The Toynbee Convector is one of my all-time favorites. Are you familiar with, with the, the story? I'm not. I am not, but... Okay. Uh, I'll 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 check it out sometime. Yeah. Um and I I in about uh oh gosh, it would have been early 70s, I think. I have it written down on my website. I attended a talk that Ray Bradbury gave at the Palace of Fine Arts and transcribed most of it. And uh you talk about a, a walking visionary. I mean he he, he practically you know, sets the standard in that regard. One movie he pointed out to me, uh, I, I he turned me on to, actually true, I'd seen yeah. King Kong before, but he said, see King Kong on a big screen in a theater, not on TV. And I finally did that in the 70s. And what a revelatory experience. You're on the, on the balcony seat seeing this, this awesome, terrifying vision <laughs> around you and uh, yeah, there there was no question about about that. And then um, he mentioned a film called Things to Come. It's one of the first sound science fiction films, and uh, it's um, technically a little hokey. The sound quality is awful, but every scene in that film seems to have relevance to today. Practically, I think that would be a great film to do a remake of in a modern context, and it. it Starts with the uh, you know the world of uh, pre World War II and the film actually did a fairly good job, surprisingly really good of of uh, pr prophesizing the Second World War with the bombing raids on cities. But he then the war goes on forever and then uh, you know, too long and civilization decays and then it resurges again with this giant underground cities being built and a um, a, a spaceship being built to take people to the moon and in that film there are people who are against us going into space they're they're yeah. saying you know, we shouldn't do this and at the very end of the film there is a, a one of the very few times that i i i thought preaching to the audience worked usually i think that that's a it looks stupid, but this last, you know, the last words where he talks about, you know, the vision of, of what we can do one day and uh, looking for up and uh, going and doing new and great things rather than remaining riveted to the, uh, the traditional laden dirt of the earth forever. Um, that was uh, 
something that you know he he the inspiration that he had about that film as a child which carried with him all of his life he transmitted that to a certain extent to me when when he told us about that film when i finally looked it up and saw it and uh so that that's something that uh although it's a rather stilted old film by today's technical standards it still had some decent visuals in it and uh yeah. The music also is just um, very compelling. Anyway, uh, yeah, those it's... are a couple of films that I can think of offhand that, that fit Love that it. bill. It's definitely on my watch list. I I was reading about it and you know the story, like how how it sort of ends. It's very prophetic. We had people during the Apollo era saying we shouldn't go to the moon. You know, we should do this or that instead. And we have even today people saying, uh, you know, humanity shouldn't expand beyond the Earth. Uh, there is no planet B. So Don, as we as we wrap here, what do you what do you say to like what do you what say you to those people who who say no, where is no planet B? I think that uh, while they may be technically right, we will make our own planet B. We will create it out of the fabric of the planetary bodies around us with our imaginations and forethought to the future. And well, it, it's a part of our destiny that we can create. It's not there ready for us. We're going to have to work for it. But uh, for anyone to try to limit human potential arbitrarily, they're uh, asking to be laughed at by the future. Beautiful. Never better words spoken. Uh, Don, thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, where can people uh, find your find more about your, your work? And I'll send them your website. I'll put some stuff in the show notes. But anything you want to point people to? Oh gosh, <laughs> I need to, I need to work on my online presence. I have a creaky old website that is almost a quarter century old. That uh, I, I have a new website that I haven't touched yet. That I'm going. So I'm afraid I have very little to offer except the Google searches. Uh, Don Davis space art or space artist. Um, there are some written essays in my in my creaky old site and uh, if somebody wants to go through and then and, 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 and on the desktop it's not going to look good on the phone then that's a place to start but i'm steadily gathering resources to create a book of my art that's my big plan in my life and my big goal is to have a book of my space art so keep your ear to the wind and when, when something like that happens uh, i'll spread the word fantastic Don, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Hello, friends. Thank you all for joining us on another episode of, of Build the Future. Just to wrap, I figured I would I'd read some of the, the closing words from H.G. E. Wells' The Shape of Things to Come, which, which Don just mentioned. Reading from Gerard O'Neill's 2081. H.G. E. Wells prophetically warned us to expect such a struggle every time we try to do what has never been done before. His screenplay for The Shape of Things to Come closed with a scene in a static world which has become a little dull. A few people, both young and old, seek to break from the earth to the frontier beyond, and the scientist Cabal speaks for them. Quote, we have a right to do what we like with our own lives, with our sort of lives. His friends, Theodocopolis, who hates both technology and the change it allows, answers a language that was echoed 40 years later in the post-Apollo revulsion against technology. Quote, how can we do that when your science and inventions are perpetually changing life for us, when you are everlastingly rebuilding and contriving strange things about us, when you make what we think great seem small, when you make what we think strong seem feeble? We don't want you in the same world with us. We don't want this expedition. We don't want mankind to go out to the moon and the planets. We shall hate you more if you succeed than if you fail. The italics, quoting Gerard and Neil, are mine but how accurately Wells foresaw the conflict still engages us. Spokesman Cabal labels this a rational fear of the unknown. Quote, it's a fit of, of nerves, the thought of stepping off this planet and jumping into space. It's not a conflict we are witnessing. It is not the haves attacking, attacked by the have-nots. It is the doers attacked by the do-nots. Again, in a perceptive forecast of the risk-free society, Wells has Cabal to claim, quote, there is no happiness and safety. Our fathers cleaned up the old order of things because it killed children because it killed people unprepared for death. A revolution did not abolish death or danger. It simply made death or danger worthwhile. And when Cabal's friend cries out, is there never to be rest in this world? Cabal answers as the film ends. 
rest enough for the individual man. Too much of it and too soon, and we call it death. But for men, no rest and no ending. He must go on, at last, out across immensity to the stars. And when he has conquered all the deeps of space and all the mysteries of time, still he will be beginning. See you next week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Build the Future podcast. Uh, if you loved it, we'd be really grateful if you shared it with a friend or post a review on whatever, wherever you're watching or listening to this. That's it from us. We'll see you next time. Until then, go build.